Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Michelle O'Keefe, who killed the aspiring actress. The judicial system, unfortunately, is not perfect, even in the most developed and democratic countries. Innocent people sometimes end up serving time for crimes they did not commit, a result of investigative errors or other mishaps. Such injustices usually come to light only when the real culprit is found and proven guilty. But what happens when someone convicted of murder is exonerated years later while the real perpetrator remains unpunished because crucial evidence was lost by the police at the time? The case of young American Michelle O'Keefe, killed under mysterious circumstances in the early 2000s, shook the nation. The investigation lasted several years until the main, and essentially the only suspect, was imprisoned for a significant term. It seemed the case was closed, but after 11 years in prison, the convicted person's innocence was proven. Simultaneously, new details emerged, and another suspect appeared, likely the real murderer. However, more than two decades since the student's murder, her parents have become disillusioned with justice, losing hope that the person who took their daughter's life will face fair punishment. Let's delve into this story from the beginning and try to understand where the investigation went wrong and whether these errors could have been avoided. Who was Michelle O'Keefe? Michelle Teresa O'Keefe was born on October 11, 1981, in the quiet town of Hanford, California. The eldest of two children born to Patricia and Michael O'Keefe, Michelle grew up alongside her younger brother, Jason. The O'Keefe's were a well-off family, owning a profitable local store. Her parents were committed to ensuring their children received a quality education and could fully realize their talents and potential. Michelle was an exemplary student, excelled in sports and ballroom dancing, and was known for her attractive and artistic demeanor. She dreamed of becoming a famous actress, appearing in films, and conquering Hollywood. She possessed the talent, ambition, and attributes necessary for such a feat. After graduating high school with honors, Michelle easily gained admission to one of California's prestigious colleges. She continued her passion for dancing and took evening acting classes. Michelle actively participated in various events, appeared in commercials, and was often seen as an extra in movie and music video shoots. On her 18th birthday, her loving parents gifted her a luxurious blue Ford Mustang with a new edge design concept. Michelle had always dreamt of owning this car and was overjoyed to receive it as a present. Unfortunately, it was this striking vehicle that likely drew the attention of her killer, leading to the tragic demise of the young Michelle. The Last Shoot on February 22, 2000, 18-year-old Michelle O'Keefe and her close friend Jennifer Peterson, also an aspiring actress, headed to Palmdale, a scenic town in Los Angeles County, for a video shoot. They were to appear in the latest music video by the popular rock musician Robert James Ritchie, better known by his stage name, Kid Rock. Jennifer and Michelle were extras, dancing and revealing outfits for the video. The shoot consumed nearly the entire day, so by the time they returned to their cars parked at a nearby amusement park, it had almost darkened. Jennifer planned to go home, but Michelle had acting classes that evening. The friends chatted in the parking lot for a few minutes before parting ways. Jennifer walked to her car, while Michelle decided to stay behind to change into her regular clothes. She felt it inappropriate to attend her acting classes in the same outfit she wore for the video shoot, as it was quite provocative. With nowhere private to change on the parking lot, and finding it awkward to do so in her car, Michelle opted to quickly change her clothes right there on the street, next to her car, believing she was alone. This decision, unfortunately, likely proved to be a fatal mistake. Jennifer recalled lingering in the parking lot a while longer, chatting with her boyfriend on the phone. As she started to leave, she noticed the headlights of Michelle's Ford Mustang turning on, Believing Michelle was about to follow her, Jennifer felt reassured that her friend was safe. With loud music playing in her car, the last thing Jennifer saw before turning the corner was what she thought was Michelle's Mustang starting to back out. 
the murder of an aspiring actress. That evening, a young security guard named Raymond Lee Jennings was on duty at the park and its attractions. Around 9 o'clock, the 25-year-old heard sounds resembling gunshots emanating from the direction of the parking lot, followed by a car alarm. Lacking a firearm and equipped only with a taser, he hesitated to approach alone, knowing he stood little chance against armed assailants. Jennings promptly called his supervisor Iris Malone and reported the incident, also alerting the police. Malone arrived within minutes, so before law enforcement reached the scene, she and Jennings decided to cautiously inspect the situation at the parking lot. They immediately noticed a blue car, backed out into the middle lane and halted there with its headlights on and engine running. This was Michelle's Ford Mustang. The car owner was in the driver's seat, motionless and showing no signs of life. Upon closer inspection, Malone and Jennings observed blood inside the car and on Michelle's body, along with several bullet wounds. The driver's door was wide open and the crime scene appeared horrific. It seemed that Michelle had been chased and initially wounded in the parking lot. She had tried to escape, leapt into her car, and even managed to start it. But the assailant caught up to her and fired several more shots, depriving the student of any chance of survival. Michelle's appearance was quite provocative. She had bright makeup and a tousled hairstyle, styled specifically for the video shoot. She was also wearing regular jeans and a shiny top. Apparently, Michelle had partially changed in the parking lot, as a shiny mini skirt, matching the top, and a regular t-shirt were found next to her on the passenger seat. One of her shoes was on her foot, while the other lay away on the parking lot, presumably dropped as she dashed to her car. Crime Scene Investigation Following the security guard and his supervisor, the first to arrive at the crime scene was the local sheriff's deputy. He noted that the young woman showed no signs of life but he informed emergency services in case he was mistaken and she still had a chance of being saved. He also recorded the statements of Jennings and Malone. The arriving police officers began a thorough examination of the crime scene, gathering all possible evidence. They found several shell casings on the parking lot and noticed a bullet mark on the asphalt, slightly away from the car. This led to the conclusion that the perpetrator likely first fired a shot into the ground to intimidate the victim, then shot at her directly, as evidenced by bloodstains on the parking lot. The victim had run towards her car but didn't manage to escape, as the assailant caught up to her and fired several more shots. She died almost instantly from extensive injuries and significant blood loss. In total, five shell casings were found on the ground. Experts concluded that all shots were fired from the same weapon, but the bullets significantly differed from each other, raising questions that needed prompt answers. Also found on the ground was an earring, presumably dropped by the victim. Later, her friend identified this item, confirming it belonged to Michelle. However, the second earring was not found on or near the victim. This detail, unfortunately, was initially deemed insignificant and was forgotten for a long time, which turned out to be a crucial oversight. Theories and speculations initially, close relatives and friends of the murdered young woman were interviewed. They unanimously asserted that Michelle had no enemies or ill-wishers. Known for her sociable, open, and very friendly nature, everyone who knew her spoke highly of the student. Thus, a personal motive for the murder was almost immediately ruled out. The next theory considered was an unsuccessful robbery or carjacking attempt of her new vehicle. However, this seemed doubtful. The only personal item missing was her mobile phone, which she had used just minutes before the attack to tell her mother that the filming was over and she was heading back. Michelle's purse, containing her wallet and a couple of hundred dollars in cash, was found at the passenger's feet. Police speculated that in the confusion and darkness, the assailant might have failed to notice the purse and fearing the gunshot sounds had attracted security, didn't search the car. This could also explain why the carjacking attempt was aborted. It seemed the attacker initially did not intend to shoot, but only to threaten her with the weapon, but something went wrong. Another theory proposed that Michelle might have been mistaken for a lady of the night due to her appearance. She was dressed provocatively, with heavy makeup and high heels. It was possible the criminal noticed her on her way to the parking lot and followed her. In the darkness, 
He might have approached her with ill intentions, but upon being firmly rejected, he took her life in retaliation. Supporting this theory was the fact that her top was partially pulled down, exposing her left breast. This suggested that the attacker was likely a man. However, it was also possible that her thin strapped clothing slipped during the scuffle, chase, or as the frightened wounded young woman attempted to get into her car. The Sole Suspect The first person interrogated was Raymond, the security guard on duty at the parking lot, who was believed to be the sole witness of the incident. He confirmed hearing gunshots and a car alarm around 9 in the evening, immediately reporting it to his supervisor and calling the police. Raymond noted he saw no one on the parking lot before or after the shots. No one fled or left the scene in the minutes following. Given that the time was still early and the area was popular, it's plausible that others nearby might have seen or heard something. Police became interested in Raymond's background and discovered that, despite his relatively young age, he was the head of a large family, raising five children. He served in the California National Guard and aspired to be a law enforcer, working while also studying at the police academy, gaining certain knowledge and skills. As the main witness to the murder, Raymond sought to help the investigation, naively thinking that this experience would be beneficial for his academy exams. When investigators asked him to present his version of events during an interrogation, Raymond detailed his perspective on how things might have unfolded. Being a top student, he meticulously considered all details, trying to piece together a coherent picture. He hypothesized where the attacker and victim might have been during the initial gunshot and how subsequent events unfolded. He based his story on the evidence, the location of shell casings, blood droplets, the victim's belongings, and the car. He also estimated the shooting distances. At that time, Raymond didn't realize that he was unwittingly digging his own grave. He just wanted to assist the investigation and be useful. However, the detectives investigating the case drew their own conclusions, suggesting that such detailed knowledge could only be possessed by the murderer himself. Since there were no other suspects, the security guard was charged with the girl's murder. New Witnesses Several weeks after Michelle's murder, a 17-year-old African-American girl named Victoria Richardson came to the police's attention. She had been in the parking lot on that tragic evening with her 18-year-old boyfriend and a couple of friends, they had been horseback riding in the park and returned to the parking lot after dark on February 22nd. According to Victoria, they were in their car, music blaring, preparing to leave when they heard unusual sounds. Initially, they mistook them for firecrackers or fireworks, paying little attention, but then realized they were gunshots. Victoria recalled seeing, just a minute and a half earlier, a man in a security guard's uniform walking towards a parked blue Ford Mustang nearby. After the strange sounds and the activation of a car alarm, the friends got out of their car and saw the Mustang, which had rolled backwards and stopped, no longer moving. Reportedly, they saw the security guard again, who warned them of an armed person on the parking lot and advised caution. Hearing this, the group hurried back into their car and cautiously left the parking lot, trying not to draw attention. When asked to describe the guard they interacted with, Victoria mentioned he was a middle-aged, heavy-set African-American man. This description matched another employee who had worked in the parking lot the day before Raymond's shift. This second guard was immediately detained and questioned. He had a solid alibi as he was at a family gathering at the time of the murder, confirmed by about 20 people. Therefore, despite inconsistencies in the witnesses' accounts, Jennings remained the sole suspect. Prolonged Investigation and Arrest After five years, the investigation insisted that Raymond was the killer, partly because his knowledge and skills in forensics could convincingly deflect suspicion away from himself. However, evidence and witness testimonies didn't align coherently. The crime itself appeared irrational and odd, with no apparent motive for the suspect. Raymond had his own legally acquired pistol, which wasn't with him on the night of the murder. He presented this weapon to the police, and forensic analysis confirmed that the bullets weren't fired from it. 
Investigators speculated that he might have hidden unregistered firearms, but this theory was unsubstantiated. Meanwhile, the murdered girl's parents conducted their own investigation, hiring private detectives. Patricia and Michael felt the law enforcement was inadequately handling the case or simply inactive. They actively engaged in interviews and TV appearances, sharing their story to pressure the authorities. They were convinced that Raymond was responsible for Michelle's death and should be punished. Although there were no strong reasons to detain him initially, Raymond went to Iraq for military service, where he stayed for almost five years. Upon returning to the United States, he was immediately arrested and jailed. Raymond consented to a polygraph test but failed, which worked against him. Unable to post the million-dollar bail set, he had to remain in custody for about a year while investigators and his defense prepared for trial. Trial and Verdict According to the prosecution, the security guard, Raymond, mistook Michelle in her revealing outfit for a sex worker and followed her to her car. After she rebuffed his advances, a scorned Raymond opened fire and then radioed his boss about the incident, stating he wouldn't approach the crime scene. The defense highlighted that the murder weapon was never found, either on the day or later. There were no DNA traces, fingerprints, or any signs of Raymond's presence at the crime scene. Interestingly, epithelial particles under the victim's nails did not match Raymond's DNA. Instead of probing whose DNA it was, the investigators convinced the court it was incidental contamination unrelated to the case. Raymond's personal belongings, car, locker, and home were thoroughly searched for the murder weapon, but a gunpowder residue test on his clothing was strangely not conducted at the time. Notably, Raymond resigned a few days after the incident due to threats from unknown individuals and returned his work uniform, which police received only a week later. It was claimed that he had thoroughly washed the uniform before returning it, thus erasing any gunpowder traces. However, traces of sweat and dust on the uniform indicated it hadn't been washed. Victoria Richardson, the aforementioned witness, testified in court, stating she saw a guard at the parking lot during the shooting. But she didn't specify who she saw, citing darkness and possible confusion. The prosecution seized upon her testimony as evidence of Raymond's guilt. The jury deliberated for a week but couldn't reach a unanimous decision. As a result, a new trial was scheduled to give both sides time to prepare. In February 2009, 11 out of 12 jurors found Raymond guilty of murder. In December 2009, the Supreme Court convicted Raymond Jennings of murder under aggravating circumstances, sentencing him to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 40 years. Raymond maintained his innocence, asserting in his final statement that he had no remorse since he didn't commit the crime. However, Michelle's parents and brother were convinced of his guilt and satisfied with the verdict. New Trial and Acquittal Raymond Jennings spent nearly 11 years incarcerated, losing hope and justice as his appeals were repeatedly denied. However, in late 2015, renowned attorney Jeffrey Ehrlich and his son Clinton, a law student at the time, took interest in his case. They revisited the case files and found numerous errors, inconsistencies, and blatant violations in the evidence and trial proceedings. The Ehrlichs believed Raymond was wrongfully convicted and set out to prove his innocence. They compiled all evidence and appealed to the department responsible for reviewing convictions. Specifically, they pointed out that Raymond's uniform showed no gunpowder residue or blood splatter, only sweat and dust, indicating it wasn't washed. Additionally, they noted that Raymond was unarmed and detectives failed to consider other individuals present at the park that evening. New reports suggested the murder was a spontaneous act, likely a botched robbery attempt. Moreover, Victoria Richardson, the main witness, and her boyfriend, both with a criminal history, were serving time for armed robbery at the time of the final trial, but were never considered suspects. The mix of different cartridges fired from the same gun unusual for someone with military training, hinted at a street gang style. Richardson and her boyfriend were part of such a gang, but since they weren't initially investigated for Michelle's murder, many leads were irretrievably lost. 
Notably, the boyfriend wore an earring resembling the one found at the crime scene on the night of the murder. Despite failing to prove the criminal couple's involvement in the aspiring actress's murder, the Ehrlichs successfully established Jennings's innocence. Consequently, the former guard was factually acquitted, a significant distinction from legal or presumptive innocence. Sergeant Raymond Jennings was released from prison after nearly 11 years for a crime he didn't commit. The judge noted that jurors weren't informed about the presence of gang members at the crime scene that evening. In March 2017, Jennings received a half-million-dollar compensation for the wrongful conviction. A devout man, he later stated that God had heard his prayers and justice had prevailed. Only Michelle O'Keefe's parents remained deeply upset, believing the man they thought killed their daughter was wrongly freed. Having also lost their son in a car accident, the O'Keefe's divorced, clinging to the belief that their daughter's supposed killer had been punished. Despite the case remaining unsolved, the likelihood of anyone being held accountable for Michelle's murder is now extremely low. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel and also don't forget to click the bell. There are many shocking stories ahead.